Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our May webinar here in our series called Taking Care of Your Financial Health. I'm Sandy Vandenberg, and I'm Director of uh, Plan Giving and the Foundation Office. I sure miss seeing all of your smiling faces when we were meeting on Saturday morning, but we do really hope to get back to that again when uh, the hospital is able to open up our meeting rooms for public uh, attendance. So we're, we're moving in that direction, but we're not quite there yet. So thanks for joining us online. And I know you're going to learn a lot today from our presenters. So I um, also wanna uh, thank uh, Alex Baker, who's in our media services room and, and Margaret Duran, my colleague, we're coming to you from the auditorium at Torrance Memorial on the campus here. And uh, it's great to have their support in, in uh, dealing with the te technical aspects of doing all of this. The other important uh, group involved in this series is our Professional Advisory Council. They are a volunteer group of estate planning attorneys, financial planners, accountants, fiduciaries, and uh, life care managers who help us to educate the community on charitable and estate uh, tax planning and uh, just helping you give attention to your financial health. So we really appreciate their support in uh, bringing us these, uh, helping to bring these seminars to the community. The um, PowerPoint we uh, have for today for the handout was emailed to all of you who registered in advance and uh, when you received my email yesterday with a link for the Zoom and the handout is available. It will be posted online too after when we uh, do the, get the recording posted. We are recording the webinar today and uh, it will be posted online with that too. So you'll be able to share it for other, with others. If you would please hold your questions until the end, well, actually you can enter them in the chat feature as uh, we're going through the, uh, the presentation. We will deal with the questions at the end of the presentation, but do enter them in chat and uh, you can find that at the bottom of your screen about in the middle. If you click on that, a little box will open up and you're able to write out your question there. If you um, would rather call it in, you can call 310-784-4843. 310-784-4843, you can call that number and Margaret will pick up and she will take your question that, that way as well. Your view on Zoom is controlled by you, so you can look in the upper right corner of your screen and you can see how the, you know, to look at the gallery or to just see the speaker view. So that will be, um, that's something you can play around with. But Alex has it set up where you'll see the speaker on the screen with the PowerPoint too. Um, let's see, when um, after in a week or so, we'll be able to, we'll post the what, recording online, as I mentioned, and I'll email everybody who had, a, uh, RSVP'd in advance so that you know where to find that video and uh, can watch it again or share it with others. So I always like to provide a little um, update on Torrance Memorial. Um, we're hearing more about COVID numbers being on the rise again with uh, these new variants that are come out, coming out. And I'm happy to say that our input, inpatient numbers have seen a slight increase, but they're still under 20. And so we're we're um, doing okay that way. And it's kind of what has been said, especially for those who are vaccinated, you may still get sick, but it's a, a milder case and doesn't require the hospitalization. So we continue to encourage everyone to get the vaccinations um, that are still available. The other big news we have right now is our El Segundo building is open. The urgent care opened on April 11 and other offices there, the primary care, OBGYN, pediatrics, and other specialties have started seeing patients there on site. As you see on the screen here, uh, the, there's a community open house on Saturday, June 4, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. You're welcome to come by and uh, get a tour of the building and see what a, what a great new facility this is to address the needs of, of those in the El Segundo area and surrounding areas, or even those I, from, the, from Torrance. I, I spoke with someone today whose doctor moved there and he is driving from Rancho PV, I think, up to see his doctor in El Segundo. So it's, a, it's a really a lovely facility. And here's a little video to give you an introduction to it. Welcome to our new state-of-the-art medical center here in El Segundo. 
Torrance Memorial and Cedar sinai have collaborated for the past several years to develop and bring you this new medical center so that we can better serve the communities of El Segundo and the surrounding area. Let's take a look. We're excited to welcome patients to this modern, beautiful 42,000 square foot facility, which also includes a Torrance Memorial Urgent Care. Let's go inside. Conveniently located on El Segundo Boulevard with easy access to care, the medical complex provides medical care for the whole family. We offer multiple medical specialties at this facility, including primary care, pediatrics, OBGYN, cardiology, pulmonology, gastroenterology, oncology, and ear, nose, throat. We also have many services in the same location, including urgent care, endoscopy center, imaging, and lab draw stations. We look forward to serving you, your family, and, and our community. community. So you can see it really is a beautiful facility and uh, we hope you'll come by on June 4 to see it for yourselves. There's beautiful artwork inside too, so come by and visit. One of the things we often get requests for in our educational um, seminars is for Medicare. Uh, we, we already have a group, our Torrance Memorial IPA does a wonderful program called Medicare 101 and they do that on a monthly basis. It also has been on Zoom lately. So um, for the last couple of years, the next one is on May 25 at 6.30 p.m. So you can find more information about that uh, at torrencememorialipa.org. And uh, there's on that homepage, I think, Medicare 101, there's a link there for you to get the details and, and the uh, Zoom link. We also do health lectures here. Our Miracle of Living series that always happened on the third Wednesday of the month has continued through COVID on Zoom. And the next uh, lecture is on brain health, stroke, and emerging technology. And it will be held on May 18, I believe also at 6.30. So um, you can search our website for that at torrencememorial.org and you can search um, for the, the lectures there. I mentioned that I'm director of Plan Giving, and Plan Giving is the, the kind of giving you want to do through your estate plan and being able to, um, you know, continue your, your legacy and your giving beyond your lifetime here. So it, it is something that is really important in, uh, in the support of Torrance Memorial. We're a nonprofit hospital, and we do depend a lot on the community for the support we need to continue providing care. And uh, you know we don't turn anyone away if they have insurance or not, we, we care for them. And so the, the support of the community really does help to keep our doors open and keep continuing to uh, provide that great support. On the screen, you see some of the uh, various types of plan gifts. There are, there are some that are income generating for you uh, as uh, you, know, you make the gift. You get a tax deduction that year, and then you continue to receive income for the rest of your life. And that would be the two, three, and four on there, the gift annuities and the charitable remainder trust. So they're wonderful tools. I wanted to highlight a little bit um, today the bequest. It's the, it's the most common type of estate gift, and it's, um, as it, you know here, it's simple. You include some language in your your trust document and your, you are able to assign a percentage or an amount to give to Torrance Memorial. There's flexibility because you can change your mind, revise and update anytime during your lifetime. Um, it, it's versatile, whether it's a part, a kind of property or the dollar amount or the percentage I mentioned. And you also, um, you know, the estate doesn't get taxed on that. So it's, it's funds you can give to, um, to Torrance Memorial and there would be um, no tax to your estate or to your beneficiaries. We do have a heritage society here, which is uh, the group of folks who have included us in their estate plan. We love to appreciate you while you're with us. And so if you have included us in your estate plan, please let me know. And uh, my phone number and email address is there. And we would love to be able to acknowledge you for, um, for the gifts you are giving. 
It's interesting to note that two of three Americans um, don't, according to some of the statistics, don't have an estate plan. So today's uh, teaching will be really important for those who might fall into that category. And we hope that you'll take action to uh, get yours established. We do have a website here, which noted, which is noted, it has a lot of great information about plan giving. And available on that site is this estate planning kit. It's a wonderful tool to, there's a, there's a lesson, a lesson book and a, and a record book, and it allows you to bring together all the various aspects of your estate plan into one place. So your bank accounts, your assets, your, you know, your beneficiaries, all of it can be put in one place. So it's really a great tool that can either be printed and filled out by hand or can be even filled in digitally so that you have it electronically. So do give attention to that and, um, and make, make use of that. I've included how do you can make a donation now to Torrance Memorial here so that if you're able to um, support us, we are most grateful for all of that. Now I'd like to introduce one of our co-chairs. We have two co-chairs with our Professional Advisory Council. One of them is Grace St. Clair. She's an estate planning attorney. And here with us today is Larry Takahashi. He's a certified financial planner here in Torrance. His primary focus is helping clients build strategies for a successful retirement, including creating an effective retirement income plan and minimizing the impact of taxes during retirement and on their estate. Larry is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so to get things started, I do need to read this disclosure. This material is for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, please consult qualified professionals. So today's webinar is entitled Estate Planning Basics in 2022. And let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, Eric Harris is an attorney at the law offices of Hofer and Harris a trust and estate law firm in the Riviera Village of Redondo Beach. He focuses exclusively on estate planning and post-death estate administration. Eric is a board certified legal specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law as recognized by the California State Bar Board of Legal Specialization. Uh, next we have Nadia and T. Nadia is a financial advisor and partner with Riviera Wealth Management in Redondo Beach. She's a private investment management portfolio manager who's earned her MBA and Chartered Retirement Planning Counselor Certification. She's been involved in the financial services industry since 2006 and consistently works with clients to develop strategies to help build and preserve wealth and achieve their short and long-term financial goals. Nadia serves on the board of directors for the Redondo Beach Chamber of Commerce, and she is a proud new mom of a beautiful baby daughter, Scarlett. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Nadia. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I will, again, my name is Nadia Yanti, and I will kick things off um, for the estate planning basics um, presentation with a couple of examples. So let's take a look at the first one that um, we're seeing on the screen here. Uh, it's crucial to remember, you will need to have estate str uh, strategies in place, both during your lifetime and at death. Uh, in our first scenario, Maria's first marriage ended in divorce. She remarried and had two children from her second marriage. Maria updated many of her key state documents and felt comfortable with her estate strategy. But what did she overlook? The beneficiary of her $800,000 401k plan and $200,000 insurance policy is Tony, her ex-husband. If she dies, her current husband and two children may not benefit from, um, from the... Uh, two accounts, the insurance and the 401k. In our second example, um, Dar Darlene is a single parent with a young child to take care of. Um, Robert, her son, is age three and is still in daycare. 
Darlene has been so busy with her career and raising um, Robert, she has not executed any of the basic estate planning documents, but she is concerned about who would raise Robert if anything happened to her. So what is she to do? Um, how can planning avoid confusion over who should take care of Robert if she passes away before he's an adult? So let's find out. So what we'll cover today uh, in my part of the pr presentation uh, will be some of the estate planning basics. Um, there will be, uh, I'll start by explaining the four key estate planning documents, three of which everyone should have. Then we'll move on to talk about the roles and responsibilities of the people you name to serve in those documents. And finally, we'll focus on why it's important to pay attention to how an account or an asset is titled. We'll also discuss what type of assets have beneficiary designations and why it's important to ensure that those you name on those designations are uh, consistent with the overall estate strategy. So as part of the basic estate plan, you should have these four uh, basic estate planning documents. Uh, the will, durable power of attorney, advanced health healthcare directive and revocable living trust. Uh, if you already have these documents, be sure to review them regularly. Life events such as deaths, births, divorces, marriages, inheritances, or even just a change in state residency often lead to changes in your goals, so your documents should change as well. Be sure to talk to your attorney about additional specific language authorizing fiduciaries to access and manage your digital information and accounts, like online accounts or email. And it's important to update your estate planning documents when moving from one state to another because state laws vary. It is always a good idea to make sure that your estate planning documents are uh, designed to work well in the state where you live. You should also review your basic documents as changes occur in federal and state tax laws. So at a minimum, every adult, regardless of age and net worth, should have a will, durable power of attorney for financial matters, and advance healthcare directive. These will help you control your assets and healthcare decisions both while you're living and at death. And then here's a tip. If you have, if, if any of you here today have children over age of 18 that are off to college, that child should have these same documents uh, because for the most part, uh, children over 18 are considered adults. Um, so if something happens, you will need a power of attorney or for healthcare or a healthcare directive in order to um, talk to doctors and be able to discuss details about child conditions should something happen uh, to your child. So let's take a look at each one of these documents in a little bit more detail. So let's, a, a will accomplishes a number of objectives. First, it provides directions for distributing your assets to your family and other beneficiaries upon your death. Your attorney can customize its provision to meet your needs. You appoint personal representative or executor to account for all your assets and your liabilities, pay final expenses, pay any taxes due, and then distribute your assets to final beneficiaries. A will is the only way to designate a guardian for minor children. A judge must still approve this appointment, but you have expressed your wishes through this document. If you have minor children, it's wise to include a trust to manage assets for them, at least until they're age 18 as well. To be effective, a will must be filed in probate court. Probate is a judicial process for managing your assets if you become incapacitated and for transferring your assets in an orderly fashion when you die. The court oversees payment of liabilities and the distribution of assets. Generally, your personal representative or executor will need to employ an attorney. Because a will does not take effect until you die, it cannot provide for management of your assets if you become incapacitated. 
And that's why you want to have a durable power of attorney. This document lets you name another trusted person to manage your financial and business affairs if you cannot. A general durable power of attorney allows your agent to perform all duties you typically perform, whereas a limited durable power of attorney covers only specific events, such as selling a property or investing assets. Your agent should act in your best interest with financial and business affairs, maintain accurate records, keep your property separate from his or hers, and avoid conflicts of interest. This person will be able to sell, invest, and spend your assets, so it's imperative to select someone you trust. You can imagine having such a wide-ranging powers open the doors for something such as elder financial abuse, which occur, uh, occurs in some families. You can give this power, power to the person immediately, or your attorney can write in a trigger that prompts the person to take over for you, such as being designated incapacitated by one or two doctors, uh, as specified in this document. Which is better? There is no right or wrong answer. Discuss it with your family and your attorney uh, to figure out what may be best for your situation. And of course, uh, if possible, it's always wise to name both a primary and a backup or contingent agent. And that's just in case uh, they predecease you or they have an issue where they are unable to serve as planned. Now, next, the advanced healthcare directive is um, similar to your durable power of attorney for financial matters, but this document gives someone power to make medical and healthcare decisions for you if you're not able. This document helps um, avoid court intervention and allows you to empower a person you trust to make those decisions on your behalf if you are unable to communicate your wishes. It's not enough to sign documents and put them in a drawer. You need to have a frank conversation with the person who will be acting and perhaps others in your family uh, about how you want your medical care to be handled, especially in the event of a terminal illness. And. Uh, finally, the, the previous three documents, again, are essential as a starting point for anyone over 18. And then this fourth document, a revocable living trust, is one that you may want to discuss with your attorney to see if it is suitable for your situation, and it may not necessarily be needed. Uh, if your attorney suggests creating a revocable living trust, you can be your own trustee, you can continue to receive all of the income from the trust assets, um, and you have full access to the trust principle. A revocable living trust can be altered at any point during your life. You can change beneficiaries or discontinue the trust at your discretion. At your death, this document becomes irrevocable. The person you name as a successor trustee will then follow the instructions in the trust to manage the assets and liabilities and if your trust directs to distribute the assets into your trust. You should realize that this ongoing management affects only assets that you have retitled in the name of your trust. If your attorney suggests a revocable living trust, you will want to take uh, his or her instructions regarding retitling assets and accounts. You will still need pour over will to govern any assets that are not titled in the name of the trust and also to appoint guardians for minors. Other advantages of having a living trust are a successor trustee can manage the assets on your behalf if you become disabled or incapacitated during your lifetime, and assets in the trust avoid probate process upon death. All right, next we'll take a look at the key people you will need to uh, include, and that's executor, guardian, agent, uh, who will be the durable power of attorney, an agent for healthcare directive, and a trustee. So one of the most important decisions you will make is picking the person or people who will be in charge of your assets and legally obligated to act 
in your interest. The task of each of these slightly uh, of each of these are, is slightly different. It is recommended to name more than one alternate for each role, but you may also name two persons to act together, such as co-trustees or co-executors. So let's go over what an executor does. Uh, executor is someone who carries out the directions in your will. Sometimes you'll hear the term personal representative for this role, and if you have no will, and your estate is managed by probate court, this role is sometimes referred to as administrator. This person will be responsible for collecting assets of the estate, protecting the estate property, preparing an inventory of the property, paying valid claims against the estate, including taxes and other debts, representing uh, the estate in claims against, against others, and distributing the estate property to the beneficiaries. It is important to know that the executor controls on only property or assets that are subject to probate. If you have minor children, you need to name a guardian to raise your child in the event both parents die before the child becomes an adult. While the likelihood of this actually happening is very slim, the consequences of not naming a guardian are great. If you don't name a guardian, a judge will decide who will raise your child without knowing who you would actually want uh, to do so. This is a very important role uh, to revisit over time. For example, early in your life, you may want to designate someone like a parent or a grandparent to the child. Um, but as all of you grow older and your toddler becomes a teenager, perhaps it's wise, wiser to name siblings or um, someone that's closer to your age rather than an aging parent. Next, um, in the power of attorney, you give authorization to a certain person or people to make decisions on your behalf. This person is known as an agent. Realize that this document and person have control only during lifetime. The power terminates at your death when your will or trust instructions become effective. This is an important document to avoid court intervention at uh, a very stressful time. Imagine that you don't have this document and you're severely injured. On top of your health concerns, your family may need to deal with court appearances to be able to manage your finances or make certain financial decisions on your behalf. Now, deciding who you want uh, to name as your healthcare agent is one of the more difficult and important decisions you'll make uh, when planning for the future. Your healthcare agent receives a durable power of attorney for healthcare from you, which gives your agent the power to make medical decisions for you if you are incapacitated or otherwise unable to make medical decisions for yourself. If you have strong feelings about your health care, this is a place to express them and specify as you are able. If you decide to create a revocable living trust, you will name a trustee or several co-trustees to manage your assets. Realize that the tr trustee will control only those assets that are in the trust, but he or she will manage the property as directed in your trust. So if your trust directs that the trustee ensure all bills are paid, all debts owed to you are collected, uh, and all assets are distributed in a timely fashion, the trust will end fairly soon after your death. On the other hand, you may want your trust to endure for some years or even decades. This allows you to control how assets are managed and distributed for quite some time. Perhaps you have a spendthrift or minor child to whom you want to provide income over time. In this case, a trustee will serve for a time period you direct in your trust, such as a certain number of years or until your child reaches a certain age. Now, um, earlier we talked about the importance of uh, retitling assets, especially if you establish a trust. 
Let's take a closer look at both account titling and beneficiary designations in our final section. You can liken uh, these top, uh, topics to off-ramps um, on the interstate highway. Depending on how you title assets or designate beneficiaries, assets can go uh, different directions at your death. For example, assets titled in your name alone will be governed by your will and go through probate. Assets in trust or held in joint tenancy will bypass probate. Again, neither direction is necessarily right or wrong, but one or another may be more suitable for you. You should discuss these possibilities with your attorneys uh, when you meet to put those documents together. Now let's take a closer look at how titling matters starting with assets in your individual names. Your executor will control these assets and he or she will follow the directions in your will. They will uh, be distributed at the conclusion of the probate process. Assets in your revocable trust are controlled by the trustee or successor trustee. The trust document provides instructions and they will be distributed or managed according to the terms of your trust. A beneficiary designation acts a bit differently. This is a contract between you and the financial institution and the terms of that contract take priority over everything else, even what you will, what your will or trust instructs. Your beneficiary will file a claim and a financial institution will distribute the assets. No probate, no government governance by will or trust instructions. And finally, when you title your account jointly with someone, such as a son or daughter, at your death, the son or daughter owns the asset. The outcome may not be what you intended. Perhaps you, uh, your intent was that the son or daughter would divide the value of um, would divide the value of assets among all the other siblings, but that may not happen. And even if it does, it could have some gift tax consequences for your child. Or perhaps you become incapacitated and the other owner wants or needs to move the account. The financial institution may require the signatures of both owners to do so. So discuss these implications with your attorney before deciding whether joint tenancy is the best way to achieve your goals. Now, what kind of assets are we talking about? The ones that frequently come to mind are life insurance policies, annuities, IRAs, or other retirement accounts. But also keep in mind other benefits um, or benefit plans perhaps at work where you, uh, you've completed a beneficiary designation form. So benefits such as stock options or stock purchase plans. Most importantly, be mindful of all of the designations as your family situation changes and be sure to update them appropriately. Remember we discussed Maria in the opening who forgot to update her 401k and life insurance policy beneficiary designations? She was close to designating her children. Every three to five years or whenever your circumstances change, be sure to review your beneficiary designations so they remain consistent with your wishes and objectives. Thank you, that concludes my uh, basics uh, of estate planning presentation and I'll hand it over to Eric Harris. Okay, thank you, Nadia. <clears throat> Nadia has laid out, she has laid out the basics as to essential estate planning documents and the individuals or persons named the documents and what roles they have, what their duties are. And uh, just wanted to talk real quick about uh, what happens if you just don't have any estate planning documents at all? whatsoever, you've got, you've essentially, you've got beneficiary designations, you have uh, joint tenancies, or you have pay on death, transfer on death, 
with all these things, that is an estate planning document. Uh, but usually that's not enough. And so you want to make sure you're covered all the way. There's some things that have a lot of difficulty passing by beneficiary designation, for example, like real property. It is possible in California to pass real property by way of a revocable transfer on death deed. And that's a one page, one or two page simple deed that you file and you name who you want your house to go to. You can now use that and that avoids probate. But generally you wanna have something a little more thorough at minimum uh, to avoid probate and that usually consists of a revocable living trust. So Nadia touched on this a little bit, but what happens if you just put your kid's name on everything, like joint accounts, and you put your kid's name on the title to the house, put the kid on the deed, and make, make it joint tenancy so that when you pass away, everything just is automatically owned by your kid. So that's, that's actually a, a valid estate planning uh, way to plan your estate. It's, 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 not, it's, it's probably not the best, but there are people who do estate planning that way. So what are the downsides to that? Well, anytime you put your kid's name on an account or on real property, you're making a gift and you have to report that gift to the IRS if the value of that gift is more than, as of this year, $16,000. So that means you have to file a gift tax return. Now, no gift tax will likely be due depending on how much you've given before, but you still have to jump through those hoops. Also, once you give a gift, that person owns a portion of what you used to own and you can't get it back from that person unless they give it back to you. So, so you suddenly have another person who owns what you think you own or used to own and they could give it to somebody else or they could be driving down the street and get into a car accident and suddenly they get sued and their car insurance doesn't cover the amount of the claim that they get sued for. So then they start to reach into your kids' assets and they grab a portion of your house or they grab a portion of the financial accounts. So there's issues there. But one of the main issues deals with, with tax basis. So what that means is, is if you put your kid's name on the house, for example, and you've purchased your house, say, 20, 30 years ago, and it's really gone up in value, and then you pass away, normally, if in that situation, if you put your kid's name on the house, your kid, at the time of, of your death, owns half of your house, right? So at that point, if your kid wanted to turn around and sell the house, there likely would be a capital gain tax because the tax base, the, the portion owned by the kid did not get a basis adjustment. What that means is essentially everybody who, everybody who is a, a citizen or resident of the U.S. and they own things in, in the U.S., they get that tax basis adjustment automatically for most of their assets when they pass away. But if you've given it to your kid, then that tax basis adjustment doesn't happen for whatever the kid owns. So that's a big problem. And yeah, it's an easy thing to do to put your kid on title to the house. But if your kid wants to sell the house later, the kid might end up paying a lot of capital gains tax, maybe hundreds of thousands of cap in capital gain tax. And now there's also potentially property tax implications of putting someone on title to the house. There's property tax reassessment issues. And those, those issues have been eroding. In fact, uh, uh, in 2021, we had Proposition 19 come into effect and that eroded away the parent-child exclusion from property tax reassessment. So in, in many circumstances, putting somebody on title to the house uh, could potentially jeopardize your Prop 13. So another thing that happens is when you have when you have joint accounts or 
uh, transfer on death. There's some assets that we have to you, plan that way, such as retirement plans, but there's not a lot of flexibility as well. So you can't, you can't have very thorough backup directions as to who gets the asset if the person you put on title passes away before you and let's say you lose capacity and you can no longer make the changes and suddenly there'll be planning issues. The next question you might ask is, if, if, you, if your estate goes into probate, What's so terrible about probate? So every state in the US has a probate process, but California's is particularly difficult. And the reason why probably, ha there, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is that California really balances the rights of the family members, potential claimants on the estate, creditors of the estate, and they give people a lot of time to put in a claim and to sort things out and make sure everything's handled fairly. And because of that, there's mandatory waiting periods involved in any probate process. In LA County, the, the probate process is even more arduous. And the reason is because LA County is the biggest county in the country, population-wise. And there's probably a lack of funding at the courts. There's a lot of red tape. And as a result, the probate process has slowed down. So if your estate is settled through probate, the minimum amount of time it takes in, in uh, LA County is typically one to two years to settle your estate. Whereas if you, if you didn't go through probate, it could be done theoretically in maybe a few months. So let's talk about, aside from avoiding probate, and providing for preferential tax treatment. Remember, I talked about the tax basis issues. What else can a trust do for me in the in planning? So most people who set up estate plans have additional planning objectives than just incapacity planning and probate avoidance and uh, naming guardians and things like that. Okay, so Let's talk about some of these issues here. So we have uh, you know, minor and incapacitated beneficiaries. So we're talking about the age spectrum of the very young and the very old typically. Those two populations have a difficulty managing their finances and healthcare decisions. And so if any of your estate could potentially go to any of those individuals, then you'll wanna do more, more complex planning through a revocable living trust so that it won't go through the court system. Now, what happens if you don't set up uh, the right structure or set up a trust for these situations, then there's gonna be uh, likely gonna be a conservatorship, which is a court appointed administration of an adult's uh, assets in the probate court. Or if they're a minor, there's gonna be a guardianship. And so again, similar to probate, you're, you're really trying to make sure that these assets stay out of the court system because uh, if they're in probate, there is uh, in, in the probate court, and whether it's the guardianship, conservatorship, or a decedent's probate estate, there are these issues with expense uh, and uh, time that takes to do things and a lack of privacy. So for example, uh, whenever I handle a probate estate, comes up from time to time. I always get mailers from realtors and other people who are trying to uh, let me know how interested they are in selling the, the deceased person's property. And I, I say, oh, how did they get this information? Well, they got it from, from some source in the probate court. So that's the, that illustrates the lack of privacy when you pass away. So for some people are also worried about remarriage protection. So to illustrate this example, let's say that uh, two people are married and there's a, you know, one of the spouse passes away, everything goes to the surviving spouse. The surviving spouse then gets into a relationship or a remarriage uh, with another person. 
and and then the surviving spouse passes away and suddenly this this new person who the deceased spouse meaning the first one the first spouse who died uh, there's no relation or connection to that person suddenly this this other new person owns everything and if there's children for example uh, of, of the original couple they may not get anything so that's a problem and and to uh to, to guard against that you know uh, attorneys will often set up something called an ab trust what an ab trust is is a trust that divides into two shares when the first spouse dies and half of the trust is owned by the surviving spouse and half is irrevocable and unchangeable, and the surviving spouse can usually manage it, is the beneficiary of it, but they can't give it to anybody else. No incoming new spouse or, or anybody else. And that, that also means uh, there's protection from, uh, to some extent from, uh, as I put on here, the pool boy or the pool girl or an unscrupulous caregiver uh, who wants to try to uh, reap a windfall and all of these things happen, and it happens more than people would think, and these are tough issues to guard against, and the police really don't know what to do with these situations when it comes up, because they really don't like dealing with these issues. <laughs> so uh, you can try to call Adult Protective Services, and sometimes they, uh, they may, or not, may or may not be able to uh, handle the situation as well, and so you really wanna have some safeguards in place uh, so that this doesn't happen. Also, the default for determining your incapacity. So I think I was at another Torrance Memorial event maybe five or six years ago, and a, a nurse made the comment that 90% uh, of people have some kind of period of incapacity. Uh, Sandy, you might remember that statement, but that was basically saying that maybe 10% of people die suddenly, you know, in your sleep or get a stroke or a heart attack and you die. Most people go through a period of incapacity. And so how are things gonna be managed during that period and how is there gonna be a determination during that period that you're incapacitated, especially if you don't have the mental wherewithal to make that determination. So by default, that has to be done by court order. However, you can plan around that. So planning around that involves you making sure in your trust and in your financial power of attorney, the method whereby you're determined to be incapacitated. So you can really customize that in these documents. You can say, I would like a, uh, I would like one physician, my personal or attending physician to uh, make this determination. I, I would like two physicians to make this determination. I would like no physicians to make this determination, it's, it's kind of funny because the physician clients of mine uh, often say that, <laughs> that they don't want any physicians to make that determination. Uh, and uh, you know, oftentimes it could be a disability panel, which is a physician and uh, maybe two out of the three children or uh, a physician, the surviving or the well spouse, not the ill spouse, but the well spouse, and two out of the three children. You can really customize any kind of panel you want to, to make that determination. And these incapacity determinations, they may not work 100% if you fight against the determination. So sometimes you might have a cognitive disorder or a type of dementia that makes you hostile to what's going on. And if you are if you are hostile and you think that you know perhaps these people that you've designated in your documents are trying to take over your financial matters against your wishes, that might push you back into into court again in a conservatorship. Every once in a while that happens, but uh, it usually happens through some kind of um, uh, dementia-related situation where the person uh, becomes difficult to manage. So. There's also issues with the advantages of using neutral trustees. By, by what, I, what I mean by that, neutral trustees are just, uh, mostly these are licensed professional fiduciaries. So they're people who are licensed. There's several on the pack. Um, and these people are licensed and bonded by the state of California. They're governed by the state of California uh, and managed through their licensing board to handle these 
to be appointed in people's estate planning documents, essentially, and handle these matters. And what they can do is they're, they're trained, they know how to do these jobs, they know, they know what the law is, um, they can carry out your wishes, and sometimes, sometimes things are a little too complex, or the beneficiaries are not, not at a certain age or whatever it might take um, to handle an estate settlement or handle a continuing trust after, uh, after the estate's been settled. So these neutral trustees are a good choice in many examples. And some people, uh, you know, they, they want their children to handle the job. But the, the children can't do it sometimes. They don't, if they don't get along. I was involved in a, in a, uh, I won't give out too, too much information, of course, but I was involved in a, a trust estate settlement uh, several years ago where we had a $2 million estate and there was five beneficiaries. They were all uh, siblings and they were each getting 400,000 each, right? For five beneficiaries and 2 million. So, uh, they, it, it should have, it should have been simple. It should have been something that you just divide up, but each of them wanted to be in charge. And because of that, they all hired lawyers and they completely, uh, fought with each other to the point that the lawyer fees completely ate up the estate and whittled it down to, uh, around 250,000. So each, each of the beneficiaries ended up walking away with, $50,000 after five years of battling with each other. And I thought to myself, what a terrible waste. You know, yeah, the attorneys earn fees for battling, but it's, uh, that's, that's not fun. That's not worth it. I'd, I'd much rather do something else. Much rather uh, help a family uh, avoid probate and get their, get their estate to them in a cost-effective, easy manner. So when people fight, and it's just because they, they didn't like who was in charge, and uh, and put things into court and really do these foolish things, in my opinion, uh, then you, you, uh, you're much better off with a corporate trustee or a licensed professional fiduciary or any kind of person who can handle the job and is who's considered a neutral trustee. Um, so dealing with high conflict beneficiaries can be helpful. Also, when you have a living trust, you can build in checks and balances to that. We already talked about disability panels and how you can be declared incapacity by, incapacitated by a group of individuals, but uh, you can also have a trust protector in your trust. A trust protector is, is similar to a special trustee who, can, who, ha who has certain powers maybe to remove and replace bad trustees. Uh, you could have advisory panels. You could ask your trustees to consult with certain financial professionals. Uh, you could even pull in care managers and say, I, you know, for this trust, I, I wish for uh, a care manager to be involved in this person's life, maybe because they, they have uh, needs that need to be taken care of. So other great thing about a trust is you can control distribution of the inheritances. So. You know, we, uh, now I got to talk a little bit about spendthrifts, and th those are people who just don't know how to control money and or handle money the right way. And and there's a lot of people out there that fall in this category, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of them are really good people, but they just really can't hang on to money for very long. So, um, what's appropriate for these people might be what's called a support trust. And a support trust basically gives a trustee the power to make distributions for the person's health and support for perhaps their remaining lifetime or whatever is needed. Now there's, there's another way that this can be handled too, which is involves setting up an annuity when the person, when the decedent passes away, instead of paying, putting it in a support trust or giving it outright to the beneficiary, an annuity contract is set up and that annuity contract then just sends the beneficiary a check every month. And that's kind of a nice thing too. It's simple, it's low cost, it, you know, the, the person can expect to get the check and as long as they stretch it for 30 days or so, then they'll be okay. Uh, for young persons, uh, you know, it's, it's never, it's hardly ever, I shouldn't say never, but it's hardly ever a good idea to give uh, an 18 year old their inheritance outright with no strings attached. Uh, that's, it's just not a good idea. 
I, I, you know, us professional advisors often joke that the first thing they do is buy a new car, right? But, um, you know, often uh, what most people like to do is they like to uh, uh, make the inheritance available at certain ages. So maybe, uh, for example, one third at age 25, half the, re uh, half the remainder at age 30, and the remainder at age 35. So staging out that distribution over time, if the beneficiary makes an unwise choice with the funds, uh, they, have, they have a chance to make a more wise choice later. There's also failure to launch, and those are the 20-somethings uh, the, the who maybe went to college even, but you know, they just don't seem motivated to go out and hustle and make a career for themselves. Uh, they, they might be uh, uh, just involved in a life of leisure and, uh, and not worried about the future, not concerned. They, uh, you know, the kids stuck playing video games all day situation. Um, so what can you do with this? You can build incentive provisions in the trust that uh, may withhold distributions if they don't reach certain milestones or uh, might reward them with uh, more financial distributions if, if they have income. For example, you could say the trustee will distribute an amount equal to the amount that you earn in your job each year, something like that. Uh, there's also a situation where people want to receive an inheritance in trust. And maybe that, that should be in trust for their lifetime. And there might be a few reasons why. And we'll talk about those next. But one of the, one of the reasons is, uh, you know, sometimes just bad luck happens. And, you know, there's people who have trouble sleeping at night and say, you know what, I, I want to make sure that this beneficiary receives their inheritance in an asset protected manner. So we can do that with trust. Uh, so instead of receiving the distribution outright, which is kind of the standard way most people receive an inheritance, especially when they're old enough, uh, instead of receiving that outright, they receive it in a protected trust and that trust could, could be around for that person's lifetime. And what they can do is they can reach into that protected trust, pull out what they need, and whatever they leave in that protected trust is protected from their creditors, from their uh, divorcing spouse, from uh, any, anything that might happen. There's, there's some exceptions. There's some situations where a creditor might uh, be able to get into that trust. But for the most part, uh, it's asset protected from their creditors. Now, California is pretty much a poor state to live in when it comes to creditor protection. We, we don't have very good laws here. There's other states that have much better laws. There's a reason why O.J. Simpson uh, has a giant house in Florida because Florida has an unlimited homestead exemption, meaning O.J. can have a house of unlimited value in Florida, and uh, there's nothing that any of his creditors can do, even if there's a uh, wrongful death claim sitting out there. So California has nothing of the sort. Uh, all you can do here is you can take advantage of, uh, of various uh, minimum defaults. A certain amount of your real property is protected from your creditors, but it's not very much, especially considering the total value of the properties that are pretty high in value here in California. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can hold money in a 401k or IRA account. Those are much better protected from creditors than and just holding it in, in non-retirement plans. Uh, and you can buy lots of insurance. I recommend that people buy uh, you know, good homeowner's insurance, an umbrella policy on top of that. Make sure they have a lot of coverage. Make sure your home and auto is really, uh, that your coverages are up there and that you have a good insurance carrier who's gonna honor claims. So that, that's a really important thing, but beyond that, there's not much you can do. So. Uh, that's why a lot of people say, you know what, I want my kid to have his or her inheritance in an asset protected trust for his or her lifetime. And, and, uh, you know, that, that, that kid can be the trustee, mean, manage the trust, reach in and grab what he or she needs. Uh, and whatever's left in the trust, uh, remains protected from creditors. 
there's certain there's I, I'm oversimplifying. Of course, there's a there's more nuances to it than that, and there's some limitations that may apply as well. Uh, but uh, please talk to your estate planning attorney for more details. So that's where the risky jobs come in. You have you have people who just inherently have risky jobs: doctors, lawyers, business owners. Those people uh, are often, the, not often, but can be, or more likely to be subject of a lawsuit. And uh, oftentimes, they like uh, they like to receive an inheritance in a protected trust, uh, just because they say, okay, well, this creditor might get to my personal stuff, but they're really going to have a hard time getting to this inheritance. Okay. I think I went too far. Okay, so one other issue is um, nursing home care. Uh, so some of the most financially devastating things that occur to a person is, care, is, is paying for long-term care. And this is especially true in the context of uh, a situation where there's advanced dementia and it plays out slowly over time. So having caregivers in the house 24 seven is just not financially feasible for most people. Uh, because of wage and hour laws and other things uh, it, here in California involving household workers and the, the rigors of that, uh, having caregivers in the home 24 hours a day trying to take care of a person who needs a high level of care um, might cost twenty or twenty five thousand a month. I said a month, not not a year. I said a month. <laughs> so um, most people can't afford that, so then they put their uh, you know their the individual in a care facility, and that's still expensive too. You know that might be nine, ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a month. So these costs will eat up an estate pretty quickly and um, so what can be done in your estate planning documents is you can put terms in there that will allow your designated financial persons like your trustee and your agent under power of attorney to do various things to transfer assets to your family and loved ones so that you qualify for Medi-Cal. That's the state, uh, state where the state pays for your long-term nursing home care. Uh, now, if you have if you don't have your house, for example, in your trust, and you, you have, you, you, you've had Medi-Cal long-term nursing home care, the state will then go to your probate estate and they will, they will take reimbursement against that. So they'll put in a claim and they'll get paid back for the amount of money that was paid out for your long-term nursing home care. So the difference there is if you have a living trust, suddenly they can't, they don't have an ability to put in a claim anymore because there was a change in the law in January of 2017 that said that if this happens, um, they cannot put in a claim anymore. So there's you know a lot of people in their planning, they wanna tr try to plan for that uh, possibility. They wanna make sure that, uh, that the, if there's an ill spouse and a well spouse, that the well spouse has enough assets uh, you know, so that they're not in a financial pinch, so that if the ill spouse has um, has to be admitted in, into a Medi-Cal facility, uh, there's enough assets there to take care of the of the well spouse. Uh, there's also something called special needs trusts, and these can also be built from your re revocable living trust, or they can built be built as a standalone document. Uh, special needs trusts, what they do is they protect the inheritance for someone who's disabled, who is on state benefits like SSI and Medi-Cal, and if they're developmentally disabled, meaning they have a, a significant developmental disability that stops them from working and they, they got that disability before age 26, uh, then they also would uh, potentially be uh, a beneficiary of very generous benefits from the regional center. Um, re the California has regional centers all around the state that provide benefits to developmentally disabled persons. And you could really take advantage of those benefits for the, for the benefit of those disabled persons uh, by having a special needs trust. Because sometimes 
If you don't have that special needs trust, then the person may not qualify for all the best benefits from the regional center. So there's also caring for your pets. Uh, most people, you know, they just, they, they have something in the estate planning documents that, that just say, hey, if I pass away, make sure that my pet goes to this person or that person along with $5,000 or $10,000 or, or something like that. Or they don't mention pets at all. <laughs> so that's a perfectly fine way of handling uh, the, you know, the disposition of your pets if you pass away. But some people like to go a few steps further and that involves uh, setting up a, um, a pet trust. So as of about 10 years ago, in California, you can now set up a pet trust and a pet is considered to be a uh, valid beneficiary of a trust. So uh, I think we remember uh, the case of Leona Helmsley, I believe, who left millions and millions of dollars to her pets. Um, so there, you know, there, you, you, you really can set up an elaborate structure for your pets if you want to uh, under California's pet trust law. Okay, uh, next is property tax planning. So with the trust, you can do uh, you can do more in terms of uh, uh, you can do terms of more of giving a family residence to uh, to a beneficiary. Let's say you have multiple children, and one of them wants the house, and the other doesn't care. Or, you know, maybe they they all want the house because they all want to try to keep the low prop. 13 under the parent-child exclusion from property tax reassessment. So you can set up rights of first refusal in your trust document. You could say this kid gets the first right to have the house or this kid gets the second right. Or you can say a neutral trustee should flip a coin and uh, determine who gets the first right. Um, so you can really uh, get that dialed in in a, in a good way. And if you don't have those provisions in your trust document, what will happen is it might force your kids to have to uh, get an expensive bridge loan in your estate if there's not enough assets to equalize distributions. Let's say your house is the most valuable thing you have and you have retirement plans that are gonna pass by beneficiary designation. Uh, in that situation, uh, you know, there has to be some kind of buyout uh, for one kid to get the house. And if the buyout doesn't handle, if the buyout is not handled the right way, uh, through through rights of refusal or an option in the in the trust document or the will if it's gone through probate, uh, then there is uh, there's going to be a partial reassessment of the property taxes unless they uh, they get an expensive bridge loan and that's that's more uh, trouble to, than it's worth to talk about at this at this presentation but it's uh, it's a complicated thing and you wanna talk about that with your estate planning attorney if that applies to you. But that can be handled very simply in your living trust uh, to avoid that situation. So uh, of course the living trust provides the best opportunities for tax planning. And uh, what I mean by that is estate tax avoidance, uh, preferential capital gains treatment and in, in a trust, you can also do plenty of wait and see approaches. So you can say, uh, okay, this a special trustee or a trust protector has the power to modify the tax treatment of the trust 50 years down the road, for example, if the, the laws are such at the time where it would be better to not worry about an estate tax shelter and instead worry about capital gains treatment. Because uh, oftentimes these, these two issues are opposed to each other. If there's an estate tax concern, you plan for that, suddenly you mess up the, the capital gains planning and vice versa. If you plan for capital gains, you mess up the estate tax planning. And so um, a way to get around that is to have uh, a more flexible design in your trust documents that would perhaps allow for an early termination of a trust that's acting as an estate tax shelter so that suddenly there's preferential capital gains treatment. So you really have a lot of planning flexibility. Also, uh, in terms of intergenerational wealth transfer, uh, you know, these days, well, let's say, okay, when, when I was growing up, uh, and that wasn't too long ago, but when I was growing up, there was uh, people, people tended to have more children, right? And so assets would flow down uh, to all the children 
and it would be spread out among more people. And today, people are having less children, seems seems like, and uh, and so you have assets that are kind of funneling down, maybe from both grandparents to the to the parents, and then it might end up with one grandchild who's kind of getting assets from both sides of the family, you know, one or two children. And so you see a funneling of wealth, and. Uh, you can you can do planning for these situations and you can make it so the inheritance that comes down from the grandparents and from the parents to the grandkids, you can make it so it stays outside of that grandkid's ownership. And what that does is it avoids estate tax problems for the grandkid. When the grandkid, uh, you know, gets old and passes away, uh, they'll look at the grandkid's estate and they'll, they'll just see what the grandkids own. And the grandkid won't be uh, subject to any estate tax as to what comes to the grandkid through these special trusts that were set up by the grandparents and his parents. So that's intergenerational wealth transfer. Um, also, last, you can benefit charity with the trust and you can benefit yourself. This is called a split interest trust. And that's the last thing I was gonna talk about today as there's common scenarios involving charitable split interest trust where you can benefit charity and you can benefit yourself. So let's say you have a highly appreciated asset, like you have old stock or you have rental property that has that you've owned for 30 or 40 years. So it has a low basis. You bought it back in 1970 or something and you've, you've had it as a rental and you've depreciated it over time so that the basis of that is very low now, and you're tired of the property, uh, you're tired of managing it, you just wanna get out of it and have a more simple, complex, uh, not complicated life. You wanna sit on a desert island with a nice drink in your hand and just not worry about that, right? So, uh, so what can you do about that? Well, you could sell the stock, you could sell a rental property, but that's gonna incur a large capital gain tax most likely. You could do a 1031 exchange to another rental property, but that just puts you back into the same problem you were with, meaning you're still uh, you're still managing property. So what you can do is you can set up what's called a charitable remainder trust. And a charitable remainder trust, what that'll do is that will take ownership of the rental property or the highly appreciated stock. And when it's owned by the charitable remainder trust, it can be sold with no capital gains tax liability incurring. And that's great because suddenly you get out of paying that big tax bill. At, at that point, what happens is for your remaining lifetime, you, you're paid five or six or 7%, somewhere around that number of, of the value of that asset for your remaining lifetime. And it could, you know, your remaining lifetime depends on how old you are and, of course, and what happens. You could also choose a term of years. You could say, I want, it, I want this to go for, for 10 years. I want this to go for 20 years. So at the end of that term, whatever is left in the trust then goes to charity. So you could set up a, uh, a trust that involves, that involves uh, something that makes your life easier and pays you an income stream and gets you out of paying a big tax. And you also get a big tax deduction when you uh, set up the trust as well that you can apply toward other assets like IRA accounts. And um, and you can also benefit the charity, in this case, uh, Thorns Memorial Foundation. So there's also, there's also uh, a situation that if you have large retirement plans, when I say retirement plans, I mean IRA, IRA accounts and 401ks, um, things like that. Um, if you have these types of accounts and let's say you only have uh, one or two children and uh, you know, you, essentially they're gonna receive that asset when you pass away. Uh, now, if it goes to your spouse, there's no problem. Uh, your spouse just continues on with owning those accounts. But the big problem happens when your surviving spouse passes and that, that retirement plan goes to your children because under most circumstances, it has to now be paid out within 10 years. So let's, let's think about a $2 million retirement account. Okay, let's say you have one child and you have a, you have a $2 million retirement account. Um, 
So under the new law, the, un, under the SECURE Act, which passed in 2019, and most people don't know that this law passed because they, you know, uh, it was passed uh, with both houses of Congress. <laughs> uh, and so it kind of slid by most people's attention. There wasn't a fight over it in the, in the news. But uh, what happened is it forced these retirement plans to be paid out over 10 years. And there's new tre proposed treasury regulations that came out this year that also says that these, these have to be paid incrementally, uh, meaning evenly over that 10 year period. So, you know, let's talk, let's talk about the example with $2 million and uh, one beneficiary in retirement funds. If that's paid out over 10, 10 years, your beneficiary is going to have $200,000 of extra income to report on his or her income tax returns every single year. That's going to create a crushing income tax liability. So what can you do to get around that? Well, uh, you can set up a charitable remainder trust to, to own that IRA account when you pass away. And what happens is uh, instead of it being paid out over 10 years, it could be paid out over a longer period of time or, or whatever, but whatever term it's paid out over, um, it's paid at five or six or 7%. And the tax, the, the, the tax deferred income changes when it goes into the IRA. So it's no longer considered tax deferred income. It's actually, it's actually converted to a much, much lower tax rate. And, uh, it's, it can be, gradually spread out over time. And, and suddenly uh, you, you, you have a beneficiary who is uh, going to probably get more assets than uh, they would have otherwise gotten in that situation. So, uh, and then at the end, it goes to the charitable beneficiary, in this case, hopefully Torrance Memorial Foundation. Um, so these are, these are two common planning scenarios that I'm seeing a lot right now. For people who live in the South Bay, you know, middle class people, uh, aerospace people with large retirement plans, uh, you know, South Bay is a very real estate heavy investment area. So, you know, a lot of people might have a rental property that they might want to do with this situation. So I want you to think about your situation or the people that you might know in your life and see if that might apply to them. And if so, then we, we might have a solution to help them. So these are the most common estate planning issues that um, that I run across in my estate planning practice. And for more uh, for more information on this, of course, talk to your estate planning attorney. That person will be able to help you uh, make sure that these are handled the right way. So I'm done with my part of the presentation. I believe we should go to questions next. Thank you, Eric and Nadia, for the great information. And I am going to pass along a couple questions to Eric. So if you do still have questions, please submit them in the chat. And I'll give these to Eric to answer now. And I'll also add that, unfortunately, Nadia had to um, leave early to get to another meeting. So um, Eric is going to take care of all the questions for us today. Okay, so how to transfer a house title 100% to a family trust. It's now titled by parents and son, one third each as joint tenants. So, um, you know, what you, wanna, what you wanna do is you wanna do this, of course, by a deed. That's how you make a transfer. And it, you, you know, you'd want to, uh, uh, the best case scenario is to transfer the house uh, that's owned one third by one third each by the parents and the children, and, and maybe have the child um, deed the deed the uh, you know his or her portion to the parents first. Then the parents would put it into their family trust from there. Uh, the only thing you have to be worried uh, worried about or concerned with is that this doesn't trigger a property tax reassessment, and that can be a complicated thing to determine. And the rules on this are too complex for me to talk about right now. And so. Uh, before you, you uh, try to do this, make sure you speak with an estate planning attorney who is familiar with the rules regarding uh, property tax reassessment stemming from joint tenancies, uh, because that, that could create an, an unwelcome reassessment. 
Okay, uh, next is what do you think about LegalZoom and other online estate planning sites? So my thought is that uh, having an estate plan, whether it's created online or through some kind of paralegal service, uh, is often better than having no estate plan at all. Uh, so, you know, sometimes um, sometimes these these methods work, uh, but if you want to have the best protection and if you have specific objectives, and we went through a bunch of them today, uh, or specific concerns, then you'll definitely not want to rely on kind of the low cost providers because they can't they they're not set up right now to uh, be able to handle planning at that level. Uh, maybe they will in the future. You know, artificial intelligence is getting good. And, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road, uh, artificial intelligence through these type of uh, uh, online services will be able to do a good job. And, and in a way, I kind of hope they do, because that means there's less lawyers in your life. And less lawyers is a good thing for everybody, right? <clears throat> so, uh, but as, of, as it is right now, it's it's probably not good enough for most people. There are some people where, yeah, go ahead and use that service is better than nothing. Okay, uh, pros and cons of naming your trust as a beneficiary of your IRA. So this is a very nuanced question as well. So first of all, um, you know, unless there's a really good reason to uh, name the trust as an IRA, as a beneficiary of an IRA account, uh, you should probably not do that. Again, this is an issue to talk about with your estate attorney. Uh, but common situations where this occurs is when you have a minor beneficiary and uh, you have a trust set up that springs to life when your living trust terminates, when you're deceased and your estate is settled and there's suddenly a trust for the child that comes to life. So some people will name their living trust or the, the trust for the child in the living trust specifically as a beneficiary on retirement plans. Uh, in that case, that's, that's the best way to handle it. Uh, however, the trust has to be drafted the right way to handle that situation. And the, the, these are among the most complicated uh, rules uh, in, in, whenever trusts are involved. Uh, retirement plans running through a trust, and there's, there's several ways for those to blow up. And when I, when I mean blow up, uh, it means that the trust doesn't qualify as a designated beneficiary and it has to be paid out. A retirement plan has to be paid out over five years. And that'll, that'll really push a lot of income through the trust. And uh, there's going to be a high tax bill. So you have to be careful with this planning. My general advice is if the person's old enough and, and um, able to handle uh, you know, the managing the asset uh, or the retirement plan, uh, adequately just name that person directly but there's so many nuances there probably regarding each one situation that this should be talked about carefully with your estate planning lawyer and other professional advisors okay All right can the reasons listed in a will document uh, such as distribution of property final payment of taxes and expenses after de after death be defined within a revocable living trust document so um, the answer to that is yes. You could, you could specifically say, I want this to be paid from my trust. Um, you know, those, those, are, those are generally a, uh, just kind of generally referred to um, in things that the lawyers who draft these documents generally describe rather than specifically, but you could state that this creditor, yes, this creditor needs to be paid or or this situation needs to be paid off before the rest of the estate's distributed out. Uh, that absolutely can happen. Uh, I, I just don't see it happen very much uh, because, um, you know, most of the time when someone passes away, you're trying to get out of paying the uh, creditors or, uh, or things like that. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's something like funeral expenses. Uh, I want to have an elaborate funeral and, uh, you know, I want my ashes to be shot into outer space. I actually had a client who did that, uh, had that as his wish, and that did happen. Um, but, um, you know, the expenses to be paid for that can be uh, talked about in your living trust document. Okay, so uh, the, the last question I have is how often should an estate plan be reviewed? So, uh, 
in my view, an estate plan should be reviewed at least once a year. And you get different answers from different lawyers, depending on who you talk to. But, uh, you know, there, uh, some, sometimes when you're at a certain point in life, if, if you're uh, getting up there in age, it's, it's, it's a good idea to review it at least once a year, maybe even more. Um, you know, you want to avoid bad things happening. And when you have an ever-shifting landscape that consists of shifting tax laws, uh, shifting assets of what you own that change coming in and out of your life, when you have um, uh, changes in the law, it's, it's difficult to keep up with all those things. And so I recommend that you talk to your lawyer and see if your lawyer has, uh, has even has a formal program that you can sign up for that would, um, that would provide this type of annual client care. Uh, to keep your estate plan up to date. Most estate lawyers don't have that type of plan, but many do. So uh, talk to your estate planning lawyer about that. All right, that's about it. Thanks so much, Eric. We're gonna wrap it up here. And if we didn't get to the question you submitted, um, I will uh, review those afterwards, or you can email me directly with, uh, here's my email address, and um, that will allow you to, uh, you know, I'll get the answer for you. So I did wanna make a couple comments too about um, the, the uh, Eric mentioned that we have professional fiduciaries on our professional advisory council or PAC list, and I would be happy to share that list with anybody who wants it, or you can actually go to our website it's located here at the bottom of the screen, the um, TorrenceMemorialFoundation.org. Just don't put this slash news in there. That's where the recording will be posted. But if you look at the, the tab that says About Us, there, it, one of the things, one of the drop down, in the drop down box, it says Professional Advisory Council. And that shows a picture of each of our PAC members and the, um, a link to their business. So that's another way to see who's there and we've vetted all of those folks. We know they're they're all um, great at what they do. So those resources are there or I can send you a list if you wanna email me. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, Nadia talked about advanced healthcare directives. Those are such important things to have in place at any time in your life. And at the hospital, we always like to have that on file for everyone too. So if you don't have one already in place, if you're interested in seeing a document, I will be happy to email you the form that is provided here at the hospital. It kind of walks you through the kinds of things you need to pay attention to and provides a place for your agent to sign and accept that responsibility. So just email me at the email address, sandy.vandenberg at tmmc.com and I will be happy to send that to you. Another great resource is a, a website called fivewishes.org. It's the number five wishes.org, and, uh, or it might be spelled out one way or the other, you'll get there. But it, they also provide a great document that really walks you through some of the things to think about. There is a $5 fee to download it or to ask, um, get a mailed copy, but I, I highly recommend that as a good resource for you to begin to have that discussion, especially with your children or your the, those who would be involved in, in making those decisions for you. So um, do take a look at that. And again, I'm available too at, um, with the phone number here or my email address with any questions you might have. So as I mentioned earlier, we will be posting this recording online and I will email, email all of those who registered in advance for the, the seminar. I have the, that list of emails. I'll send that to all of you. We have two more remaining webinars this year. July 8 is on the emotions of estate planning and uh, investing. Often, you know, we get caught up in all of the anxiety of, you know, watching the market go up and down and all of those kinds of things. So attorney Grace St. Clair and certified financial planner Philip Cook will be talking about some of those things, what you need to consider and um, not, you know, try to fall into some of the traps that our emotions will, will give us. And then on September 9, uh, financial planners Christian Cordoba and Connor Hartwell will be talking about IRA 
401k and RMD, required minimum distribution planning, to help protect your retirement. So by September, we might be able to be in person. I'm not sure yet about July, but as soon as we're able to meet in person again, we will return to the Saturday morning across the way in the Health Conference Center, but you'll get a notice about that um, with our upcoming events and lectures email to so you know what the plan will be for those two months. So again, thank you for joining us today. Um, enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a great weekend.